कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बाला गिरी भर धारी गोपी जान बाला भा गिरी भर धारी यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना या मुनतीरा वनचारी यामनाथिरावन चारी जय हराधा माधवा कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जन बाला गिरी भर धारी गोपी जान बाला भा गिरी भर धारी यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना या मुनतीरा वन चारी या मुनतीरा वन चारी Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 
Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nittai Gaur Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nittai Gaur Hari Bo. Jai Jai Prabhupad, Prabhupad. Prabhupada Jai Srila Prabhupada Gaur Premanande Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pitarine Nirvisesha Sanyavadi Paschacha De Satarine Oh, Prabhu, you, you know this water is ice cold. I don't drink ice cold water. Could you get me some room temperature water? Thank you, Prabhu. So this evening we're going to begin our seminar on the teachings of Queen Kunti. And I'm going to use, this evening at least, we will use the PowerPoint. Uh, I used this PowerPoint, this is before we, when we were discussing Queen Kunti, when we presented the Bhakti Vaibhav course. We study the Srimad Bhagavatam first six cantos. So here you can see Unit 3, Lesson 2, Pariksha Saved, Prayers by Queen Kunti. So we're just going to be looking at the prayers by Queen Kunti. I'm going to be spending time going through the teachings, what Queen Kunti was praying about. But here you can see the breakdown of Chapter 8. Chapter 8, entitled Parikshit Saved and Prayers by Queen Kunti. So it begins with Parikshit Maharaj being saved. What happened was Uttara was pregnant. She was carrying Parikshit in her womb. And Ashwatthama threw the Brahmastra weapon at her. Right? And then, of course, Uttara comes running to Krishna. 
Pahi Pahi Mahayogin Deva Deva Jagatpati. You know, like this, she comes running to Krishna, praying to him, and she prays to Lord Krishna that let the let the Brahmastra weapon burn my body, but please don't let anything happen to the child in my womb. So that is a woman's nature, naturally. They want to protect their child. Mother will always try to protect the child. So Uttara came running, to, and of course Krishna, he protected the child, that he covered the embryo and he protected the child from the heat, the burning heat of the Brahmastra. Okay. And after that happened, then Lord Krishna is getting ready to go to Dwarka. He, you know, he'd been away, he'd come to Hastinapur and Battle of Kurukshetra was there and everything. It was time Lord Krishna wanted to go back to his family, to his wives and all his relatives, the Yadus, they're all there in Dwarka. So Lord Krishna was getting ready to go back, to leave the Pandavas and to leave Queen Kunti. So at that time Queen Kunti came, just after the Lord had saved Uttara, and saved the child. Then Queen Kunti came along with the Pandavas and along with Draupadi. They all came to approach Lord Krishna. And of course, they're begging him, please stay longer. Don't go, <laughs> you know. They want to keep him there naturally. So Queen Kunti, anyway, she begins to offer her prayers, very feeling prayers. And then that goes up to 44th verse, and then at the end of the chapter, Yudhisthira approaches Krishna filled with his lamentation. Lamentation that Krishna's leaving to go to Dwarka. N requesting Krishna also. Alright, so that's the eighth chapter. So, here you can see what happened in the first part. Krishna's prepared to leave for Dwarka, and then Aswatthama releases Brahmastra to kill the child within the womb of Uttara. Aswatthama is the son of Dronacharya and he wants to kill this child. He doesn't want any descendants to remain. He doesn't want the dynasty to continue. So Uttara approaches Krishna and Krishna covers the embryo and saves Uttara. So that's that first section, Pariksha Save. Here you can see the artist's illustration. There's the embryo and there's Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna doesn't have to enter the womb. Lord Krishna is everywhere. So he's already there in the womb. And Lord Krishna, in his super soul expansion, he protects the child from the blazing heat of the Brahmastra weapon. Mm. And Uttara is saying there is no one who can save this from the clutches of death. There is no one other than Lord Krishna who can save us from the clutches of death. So Lord Krishna reciprocated with the prayers of his dear devotee and because Lord Krishna wanted Parikshit to remain and to rule the world, he protected the child. Here's the, the words of Uttara. O oh my Lord, you are all powerful. A fiery iron arrow is coming towards me fast. My Lord, let it burn me personally if you so desire, but please do not let it burn and abort my embryo. Please do this favor, my Lord. This is Uttara praying to Lord Krishna like that. And then next you have Queen Kunti coming forward and you can see here We've listed the different headings 
of the prayers which Queen Kunti is offering. And she talks about all of these different things in her prayers to Lord Krishna. This evening, we'll just cover two or three prayers. We won't have time to go through all of the prayers. Of course, there's many prayers from verse 18 up to 43, so it's like 25 verses. So we'll go through them a few few verses at a time. We only have one hour for each class. Anyway, in the beginning, Queen Kunti is describing Lord Krishna's transcendental nature. And that is very important. Remember, Queen Kunti is related to Lord Krishna. She is the aunt of Lord Krishna. She is a sister of Vasudev. And Vasudev is the father, of course, of Lord Krishna. So Kunti is aunt. And at the same time, Lord Krishna will come to Kunti and he will want to touch her feet because she's the aunt. She's the sister of his father. So the Vedic culture is you come before the senior and you show respect by touching their feet. And Queen Lord Krishna would come to K Kunti in that way. But Kunti, she knows Krishna not just only as her, her nephew, but she knows him as the personality of Godhead. And we will see that tonight. We will see that in the first of her prayers that she understood the, the position of Lord Krishna. She understood that he's not just simply an ordinary person. Of course, some influence of yoga maya is there. Yoga maya is the energy of Lord Krishna which covers up Krishna. And for the devotees, it reveals Krishna in some relationship in other just like Kunti by the influence of Yoga Maya she could think of Krishna as her her nephew but uh, at the same time she's aware of Lord Krishna's identity so we're going to read the first prayer oh, for a little quote here so Thus saved from the radiation of the Brahmastra, Kunti, the chaste devotee of the Lord, and her five sons, Andropadi, addressed Lord Krishna as he started for home. Right? Lord Krishna, I've been explaining this to you, that the Lord wants to go back to Dwarka, He's got 16,108 wives there all waiting for him, as well as all the Yadu dynasty. So naturally, he's very eager to go back to Dwarka to see the family members. But at the same time, Kunti and the Pandavas, Draupadi, they're all his pure devotees, and they have great love for him also. So it's not easy for him to leave the Pandavas and to go back to Dwarka. They don't want him to go. So here is the first verse, the first prayer of Queen Kunti. We can chant it here this evening. Namashe Purusham Namaste Purusham Twadyam Ishwaram prakrite param alaksham sarva bhutanam antar bahira vashtite kunti uvacha namashe purusham tvadyam Ishwaram prakrite param alaksham sarva bhutanam antar bahira vashtitam 
Kunti Vacha Namasye Purusham Twadyam Ishwaram Prakriti Param Alaksham Sarvabhutanam Antar Bahira Vashtitam Chant some people. Marriages. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. How many of you have all finished Bhakti Vaibhav? Anybody? Oh, <laughs> very, very less. <laughs> and what about Bhakti Shastri? How many finished Bhakti Shastri? Few only. Yeah. You know, Srila Jaipataka Swami Maharaj is very e encouraging for all the devotees to study these courses. You know, back beginning with Bhakti Shastri and then going on to Bhakti Vaibhav. And he himself has been doing it. He's been taking part and he's gone up, he's doing just, he's finished Bhakti Vedanta. Uh, so it's very nice, you know, you, you're here in Bahrain. This is a, a famous place for the devotees to study. We have many courses, we've di given many courses, Bhakti Shastri. And Bhakti Bhai Bhav, it's very helpful, very nice to get the association of devotees and study the, the books systematically. Uh, uh, so th this is the first canto, eighth chapter. This is Bhakti Bhai Bhav material, actually. Anyway, uh, you know, those of you who have the time and interest, you should try to do it. And certainly, if you're initiated, and you want to get second initiation, then you have to study Bhakti Shastri. Otherwise, Srila Jaipataka Swami Maharaj is not going to give you second initiation until you first take the Bhakti Shastri course. So it's very important. If you're, how many of you are initiated? Not everyone, only maybe less than half. Yeah? Okay. So people who are not initiated, you have to do the disciple course. <laughs> uh, that's the first thing you have to do, the ISKCON disciple course. You have to find out about Krishna consciousness, how the movement is run, and how, how to select a spiritual teacher, and what is the process of initiation. You know, we encourage all the devotees that you should get a spiritual master, you should take shelter, and go on and take initiation. 
All right, so here in this first verse, Queen Kunti is praying, O Krishna, I offer my obeisances unto you. You see, Krishna was coming to offer obeisances to Queen Kunti. He was coming to touch her feet and take the dust from her, and she's saying to Krishna, I offer my obeisances unto you. Why? And he, she explains, because you are the original personality, Purusham Tvajyam. You are the original person. She knows the identity of Lord Krishna. She understands he's not an ordinary person. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains, Abhijananti mam mudha manushim tanam ashritam param bhavam ajananto mama bhuta maheshwaram. Lord Krishna is saying that the foolish, the mudhas, they mock at me, descending amongst them like an ordinary person. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. So we have to understand Lord Krishna is not just an ordinary person like we are. We, we take our birth according to the laws of nature. But Lord Krishna, he's the controller of the material nature. He's above the material nature. And Queen K Kunti goes on to, to speak more about this. She said, uh, you are the original personality and are unaffected by the, unaffected by the <laughs> qualities of the material world. We are all affected by the qualities of the material world. But Lord Krishna is never affected by it. He is Prakriti Param, Ishwaram Prakriti Param. He's the controller of that material nature. Maya Jakshena Prakriti Suyate Chacharataram. Material nature moves under my direction, Lord Krishna says. So Queen Kunti, she's understood the transcendental position of Krishna. She said, Prakriti Param. So he's not just, he's, pra, he's above the Prakriti. He is transcendental to it. The Lord is not of this material world as we are. And you see also in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna was describing the history of the Bhagavad Gita. He says, I spoke this knowledge to the sun god Vivishwan. And Vivishwan gave it to Manu, and Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And Arjuna was listening, and Arjuna was surprised. And he said to Krishna, Oh, Krishna, how is it possible you could give the knowledge to the sun god? The sun god is so much senior by birth to you and I. You see, Arjuna was also influenced by Yoga Maya, and he was thinking, Lord Krishna and I are the same age. You know, when Krishna would meet with the Pandavas, he would offer his obeisances to Yudhisthira and to Bhima, because they were senior to him, they were older than him. When he would meet Arjuna, they would embrace because they were equals, they were the same age. And Nakula and Sahadev, they would come and offer obeisances to Lord Krishna. So they recognized, you know, different persons as senior and junior. So Arjuna was asking Lord Krishna, how could you give the knowledge to the sun god? And Lord Krishna said, oh Arjuna, Many, many births both you and I have had. I can remember all of them, but you cannot. You see, we have all had many, many births in the past. Now we're here in this 
human form of life. But in the past, we have had many different bodies in many different places throughout the material creation. We've been taking birth and dying again and again. And now we have come in this human form. And we've had the opportunity to contact the devotees. We don't remember our previous births, but Lord Krishna does. He remembers these things. We don't. So Lord Krishna, he is not affected by the qualities of the material world. And she said, you are existing both within and without everything, yet you are invisible to all. This is the mystery of Lord Krishna, one of the mysteries. Of course, there are many mysteries in relation to Krishna. But this is one point, that Krishna is existing everywhere, in, in everything. He's also within Kunti. <laughs> He's not only standing in front of Queen Kunti, but he's also within Kunti. He's within the heart of all living entities. So Queen Kunti is trying to understand the nature of Lord Krishna. In one way, Krishna is a person. He's standing there in front of her. But at the same time, she also understands that he is the personality of Godhead. And we understand God. We would say, well, God is everywhere. He's in everything. So, is he, uh, Qu Queen Kunti is not very sure. She's a, because of the, the, the yoga maya, she's unsure. Is he uh, everywhere? Is he all-pervading? Or is he just in one place in front of me? She's bewildered. This is the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna explains a similar point in the Bhagavad Gita. I hope, I hope you're all reading the Bhagavad Gita. And we should try to study. You know, before we actually can go more into the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, we need to get the basis, the foundation from Bhagavad Gita. So it's very important. That's why I say if you can do the Bhakti Shastri course, it will help you immensely to understand the Bhagavad Gita. So anyway, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains Mata Parataram Nanyat Kinchid Asti Dhananjaya Mai Sarvam Idam Proktram Sutre Mani Gana Eva. Lord Krishna is saying to Arjuna, there is no truth superior to me. And then Lord Krishna gives an example. He said, everything rests on me, just like pearls are strung on a thread. Or just like we're wearing, we're wearing many of you are wearing the, the neck beads, the kunti mala around our neck. So the beads, the tosi wood, is on the thread. And ideally you won't see the thread, you only see the beads. So Lord Krishna is using this example to explain his presence. He says, first of all, there is no truth superior to me. It's a very powerful statement by Lord Krishna. Nobody else says they are the supreme truth. You know, <laughs> could you imagine telling people, I am the supreme, you know. <laughs> even Shiva, even Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, and Ganesh, and Dur none of them will ever say, I am the supreme truth. There is no one. Only Lord Krishna can say like this. Because he is the ultimate supreme truth. And he's pointing this out to all of us in the words of the Bhagavad Gita. 
and to Arjuna that there is no truth higher than Lord Krishna and everything is resting on him. We are also resting on him but we're not recognizing it. So in this way Queen Kunti is beginning her prayers describing the qualities of the Supreme Lord that he is existing within everything. This is Sarvasya Chahamridi Sanivisto. I am in the hearts of all living entities. He's in the hearts of the demons, he's in the hearts of the trees, the dogs, the fish, the birds, the people, the demigods, every living entity. They're the Lord is in the heart of everyone as the super soul. He's within everything and at the same time he's without of everything because he's residing also in his own abode in the spiritual world in Goloka Vrindavan. And so in the hearts of everyone he's invisible to all. We have to see the Lord through the eyes of Shastra. You want to see the Lord? You have to be qualified. Who is qualified to see God? You have to have love for the Lord. Then you can see him. He is not visible to everyone. This point will be discussed in the next verse also when Qu Queen Kunti continues her prayer. We'll just go on here. Srimati Kunti was quite aware that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, although he was playing the part of her nephew. Such an enlightened lady could not commit a mistake by offering obeisances unto her nephew. Therefore she addressed him as the original Purusha beyond the material cosmos. So Queen Kunti, very, very advanced devotee, Prabhupada said she's almost on the level of Mother Yashoda, the mother of Lord Krishna. But she's showing humility. We will see today her humble nature. Although she is such an advanced devotee, she is very humble. And the more advanced a devotee is, the more humble they will become. Because the more we advance, the more we realize how insignificant we are and we will offer our respects to everyone. We will see Krishna in, in everyone and respect them. I was with Srila Prabhupada one time in London and we went to a, this temple. They were worshipping Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. They had the Trinity there. So Srila Prabhupada explained to them that a devotee of Krishna not only offers respects to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, a devotee of Krishna will offer respects even to an insect because within the insect there is also the, the Lord. He's also there. He's in the heart of all living entities. So in this way, devotees always respectful to all forms of life. Okay, so here's the next verse. Right, we can chant this one also. Maya Javani Kachanam Agyan Adhoksa Jamavyayam Nalaksham sa Nalaksham Mudadrishya 
नो नो यता मया जीवा खा अज्ञोक्सम न लक्ष्य से मुदा दृशा नो नो यता मया जीवा खा अज्ञोक्सम न लक्ष्य से मुदा दृशा नो नो यता सो ट्रांसलेशन बींग बियॉन्ड द रेंज ऑफ लिमिटेड सेंस परसेप्शन यू आर द इटर्नली इरप्रोचेबल फैक्टर covered by the curtain of the looting energy you are invisible to the foolish observer exactly as an actor dressed as a player is not recognized right so queen kunti is describing more of the qualities of lord krishna that he is beyond the range of our limited sense perception our senses are very limited we have imperfect senses that is one of the defects of conditioned souls right that we have imperfect senses we forget things we make mistakes our senses are very limited we cannot see very far we cannot see in the dark we cannot hear very clearly when vidura came to see dhritarashtra he was telling dhritarashtra how you were born blind and he said of course dhritarashtra was blind materially and spiritually he said now in your old age all of your other senses have also become useless you cannot eat properly you cannot speak clearly you cannot hear nicely the, the senses are very limited and perf- what do we know by our senses very little we can know how do we know anything we have to hear it's important for we get knowledge by hearing the process is giving oral reception but we have to know who to hear from and where to go to hear everywhere the people are hearing you go to the market prabhu pas said in the market people are busy questions and answers how much is this can you give me discount can you give me lower price like this you know the questions and answers are going on but our real business is to hear from scriptures and to hear from people who will speak on the scriptures and they should speak according to the opinions of the acharyas we should pass the knowledge on through the parampara through the disciplic succession so by our own efforts we do not have perfect knowledge we need to hear and then queen kunti said you are the eternally irreproachable factor <laughs> we want to see god it's not like you want to see you know some officer in the government i want to see him i want to see this you, we, you want to see the lord he is reserved about who he will reveal himself to lord krishna says in the bhagavad gita i am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent for them i am covered by my eternal creative potency so here also kunti is speaking about a covering 
that you're covered by your deluding potency, deluding energy. This is the nature of Krishna's yoga maya. Yoga maya acts in two ways. Just like electricity, we give the example that electricity, it can be used to heat, it can be used to cool. Right? Electricity can be used to, for the fan to rotate. Electricity can be used to power the refrigerator. We use electricity in different ways. In the same way Krishna's yoga maya acts in different ways. It will cover up Krishna to reveal him as an ordinary person to the non-devotees. The non-devotees, they will simply see Krishna as an ordinary person. They will not be able to recognize that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Sometimes people say, why doesn't Krishna come today? Then I will believe him. But even when Krishna came 5,000 years ago, there were many people who could not understand who is Krishna. You had people like Kamsa wants to kill Krishna and Sishupal was always envious of Krishna, always jealous of Krishna, wanted to be, he wanted to marry Rukmini. And you have also people like Pondraka. Pondraka, he had two extra arms put on. And then he came to Krishna and said, I am Vishnu, you should give the Suras and Chakra to me. It's my weapon. So Krishna threw it at him and cut his head off. And then you had people like, when Krishna was a little baby, you had demons like Putana come, who put poison on her breast and she wanted to kill Krishna. So Krishna sucked out her life air. So you, there were so many examples, people thinking Krishna is an ordinary person. That is one kind of maya, maha maya. But there's another maya which covers the, the devotees. And the devotees see Krishna in some loving way. Just like Nanda and Yasoda, they see Krishna as their son. And even when Krishna's holding up the Govardhan hill, Mother Yashoda's thinking, oh no, Krishna couldn't pick up the Govardhan hill. He's only seven years old. How could he pick up the Govardhan hill? It must be my husband. It must be my husband who's picking up the Govardhan hill. Mother Yashoda was thinking like that. That is Yoga Maya. You see? And then, of course, the gopis, they think of Krishna as their lover. And the cowherd boys, they think of Krishna as their very best friend. And they will fight with him and wrestle with him. And sometimes they will steal each other's food, the lunchbox which they have, because they're influenced by yoga maya. They don't see Krishna as God, but they see him through one of the rasas which they relate to Krishna by. There are different rasas. There's dasyaras, servitude, sakyaras, friendship, vatsauyaras, parenthood, and madhuryaras, the ras of conjugal love. So the devotees who have love for Krishna, who are pure, then they enjoy this kind of relationship with Krishna. And the example is given here, you see, uh, just, just like a, an actor dressed on the stage is not recognized. Uh, here you can see in the PowerPoint we talk about it. You are invisible to the foolish observer, exactly as an actor dressed as a player is not recognized. Right? If you're a good actor, then the, you know the, you, your children will not recognize you when you go on the stage. Huh? 
this example is given, not, you know, yet, nato natya darishyata. So nata, nata meaning the artist, and natya dara, dressed as a player, as an actor. And Prabhupada describes a child, he is seeing somebody acting, but the child has forgotten that his father is acting, right? The, you take the children to watch the drama and the father is in the drama, but the child does not recognize her father because he's got the costume on and maybe some makeup, he's dressed up, disguised. They don't recognize. Child has forgotten because the father has dressed in a different way and he's a different posture playing on the stage. Although the child is sitting amongst the audience, he cannot understand that, oh, there's my father playing. No, child doesn't know. Child is, sometimes we will do these dramas, you know, something, the Yamaduras will come, you know, they dress up devotees like Yamadudas, and when they come on the stage, you know, something little children in the audience will scream, you know, and they'll run to their parents. They'll be afraid, they'll be terrified when they see the Yamadudas coming. And so th when the acting is like that. And so we try to do, do these dramas. Prabhupada liked to watch these dramas. I was there one time when we did the drama for Srila Prabhupada in, in New York Temple. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada was watching and he was saying, so this is even better than my books. He was appreciating. <laughs> so, Prabhupada continues, this is taken from a lecture Prabhupada was giving. The mother can say, Oh, don't you see your father is there? He's playing there. That's your father. But the child, so although the child and the mother are both there, one cannot see, other can see. The child cannot see, but the mother, she can see. She recognizes her husband. The child doesn't recognize her father. That means one who has got knowledge, he can see. One who hasn't got knowledge, he cannot see, although God is everywhere. God is everywhere, but cannot see him. How to see him? Well, we talk about jnana chaksus, seeing with the eye of knowledge, or shastra chaksus, seeing through the eye of the scripture. We have to hear from the scriptures and then we have to see according to the vision which we are given by the, the scriptures. Just like when we worship the deity, we should understand this is the Lord. He is there. And when we chant the holy name, the holy name of Krishna is Krishna himself. One devotee, Srila Prabhupada had asked him to give a talk at the time of initiation and the devotee said, he said, Krishna is in his name. But Srila Prabhupada stopped and said, no, no. He said, Krishna is his name. There's no, it's not, if you say Krishna is in his name, then it's a little different. But if you say Krishna is his name, then there's no difference between Krishna and Krishna's name. So when we are chanting, when we're doing our kirtan, when we're doing our japa, we should understand Lord Krishna is there in his name. And similarly, when we're in front of the deities, the deity, Lord Krishna is there. He is seeing us. We come to the temple to be seen. We don't come to see, but we come to be seen. There was a blind man 
and he asked his friend, he said, can you bring me to the temple? So his friend said, well, why do you want to go to the temple? You're blind, you can't see anything. He said, well, I can't see, but I want Krishna to see me. So that is the thinking of the devotee. We come to be seen by Krishna. We are, we are not the seer. The Lord is the seer and we have to be seen. So similarly, when we're in the temple, we're very conscious, whatever we do, we will chant nicely, we will dance nicely. We're doing it all for the pleasure of the Lord. So we have to see him with the eye of knowledge. We have to purify ourselves to see God. How do we purify ourselves? We do it through our devotional service. The more we will do, actually, to do proper devotional service, you have to be pure. But we can begin, we can purify ourselves by taking up activities for the service of Krishna. Initially, we're not pure, but we can purify ourselves by chanting regularly, by coming to temple, bowing down in the temple. These activities are very purifying for all of us. Of course, people like to come eat prasadam. That's also purifying, yeah? But you have to eat a lot of prasadam <laughs> to get purified. You have to come every all the time to eat prasadam. If you only eat prasadam, then you get really purified. But if you eat all the any a, a lot of other things as well, then it won't be quite the same effect. We'll we'll nullify the effect of the prasadam by eating all kinds of garbage food. So be careful what you eat. We want to, pur to purify ourselves. We want to see God. Srila Prabhupada would say, there is only one qualification to see God. And he said, that is preem. And he quoted the verse from the Brahma Samhita. Premanjana charita bhakti vilo chanena santa sadaiva. Ridayeshu vilo kayanti. Yamsham asundaram machinchyagunam swarupam govindam adipursam tamaham bajam. When our eyes are anointed with the salve of love, then we will see God. So we want, of course, it's not just a matter of putting an ointment on the eye, but we have to. We have to purify our consciousness. Consciousness is the important element. And the more we engage in activities connected to the Lord, the more our consciousness will become purified. It will change from bodily consciousness to spiritual consciousness. And spiritual consciousness means Krishna consciousness. Krishna is the Supreme Spirit. All right. Prabhupada continues here. For less intelligent men, there must be such things as temples, mosques, or churches, so that they may begin to recognize the authority of the Lord and hear about him from authorities at such holy places. Sometimes people don't understand the importance of having things like temples and mosques and churches. They're, they're very important. You know, you get some people some kinds of politicians who say, no, no, we should build factories, we need factories, and they'll say like that. But what's important actually, th these temples, mosques, churches, they're important 
because by having these places, we have a place where we can go to hear about God. We can receive that education, that spiritual education, that knowledge which is lacking. And that it's very important for us. And we go there, we can hear, and we will also, of course, offer respects. We go to a church, we go to temple, people will be conscious how they dress. Even if you go to temples, uh, in, in, for example, in Thailand, Thailand is a Buddhist country, they have a lot of Buddhist temples, and people often, they come to the Buddhist temple, and often people in Thailand, you know, they're in a holiday mood. They come in their shorts, you know, like they're not properly dressed. So before they go in the temple, they have a box outside the door of the temple, and in the box there will be pieces of cloth, and they will tell them, cover your body, you know, put, wrap this around your legs and, and in this way then you can go in. I brought a group of people from China, they came to Malaysia and they were in Malaysia and in Ma Malaysia is an Islamic country and they have a very beautiful big mosque. So the devotee who was leading the group he brought the devotees to see the national mosque there in Malaysia. But before they could go in, they said everyone must cover their hair. And they gave them cloth to put on their hair. Because that's the tradition in the Islamic culture. That the ladies, will, they must cover their hair. Well, and they, they, they gave each and every one of them. We had a quite a big group of people. They were all from China. And they, they all wrapped their hair, <laughs> their hair up. And, and then they went into the mosque and they saw everything. So, you know, you go to a place, we learn that these things are important. You see, it's important for us. How we dress. You know, men, we... We shave our heads, you see, we, we cut, we don't have much hair. And, and the ladies, they have to cover their hair. They have to tie, at least tie the hair properly. It shouldn't just be hanging all over, but they should keep the, because that is the Vedic culture. The beauty of the woman is in the hair. And if she has her hair all hanging loose, then she's just exposing her beauty to everyone. And so the culture is like that. But so it, it, it's important to have temples and mosques and churches and because then people get trained. They learn certain things. They understand what is the proper behavior. And that that is purifying for us. And of course you come to temple, people come in, offer obeisances, say, bow down. Uh, when Srila Prabhupada was in America, sometimes people would say, why I should bow down? I don't want to bow down. Why I have to bow down? So Prabhupada would explain to these people that you may not like to bow down to Krishna, but you will be forced to bow down to old age. You will be forced to bow down to disease you will be forced to bow down to death. Devotees willingly bow down to Krishna. We are not forced. We bow down willingly. You will be forced to bow down to old age, disease and death. So it's better to bow down willingly. And by bowing down willingly with just simply with the the genuine feeling of the heart, then there'll be no more birth and death. You can get free of birth and death. So the, we try to train people like this, you know, bring the children, let them learn to bow down, train them up to bow down in front of the deities, get them to... Uh, take part in the kirtan, join the kirtan, 
And children who have that opportunity from the beginning of their life, they're very fortunate. And Srila Prabhupada also described as a young boy, he was doing Rathiatra and he was going to temple and he was seeing the deities and he would see his father also do the puja. So Srila Prabhupada grew up like that. And look, he, Prabhupada made temples all over the world, and brought Krishna consciousness to the whole world. So your children can also give them a, a good start in life, train them up to be Krishna conscious, to be devotees. It's very important. Prahlad Maharaj said, Komar Acharat Pragno. Right? He was in the Gurukula. Prahlad was in the Gurukula with the sons of all the demons, all the Asuras. And so they wanted to know from Prahlad because Prahlad wouldn't play with them. They were all playing their stupid games and Prahlad said, no, no, I'm not going to play with you. And so they said, well, well but why not Prahlad? Why, why don't you play with us? And Prahlad said, Komara Charit Pragno, Dharmam Bhagavad. From the beginning of life, you have to learn Bhagavad Dharma. Right? We waste so many years playing football, playing cricket, playing this game, that game. We waste so many years and so many nonsense activities. But Prahlad understood from the beginning of life, have to cultivate this Krishna, God consciousness. All right, so we'll stop here today. It's nine o'clock. I don't want to go on too long. Is there any question, anybody? Yes? Brahmaji was Lord, Lord Krishna wanted to actually cover himself and uh, not allow Brahmaji to understand who the Krishna is. Was that a Maya, Maya, Mahamaya or Yogamaya? Because Brahmaji was in a different mood that time. Yes, uh, that was also Yogamaya. Brahma's Brahma, of course. Well, Brahma's vision. What did what did he see? You know, Brahma. Brahma is also, of course, devotee. So this, 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 he just wanted to see the, 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 the extent of Lord Krishna's power, how powerful Krishna is. He wanted to understand more about the, the power of Krishna. So Krishna revealed to him that, it was, it was his, that his power was so unlimited, so great, that, that Brahma couldn't even begin to understand the extent of the power of Krishna. He had a, a just like a, if, if you have a light bulb and it's not the right wattage and you put it in the bulb in the connection and it'll go boom, you know, just explode. So Brahma's brain went like that, you know, when he saw Krishna expanded everywhere. So that was also Yoga Maya. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much for such a beautiful class, Maharaj. Maharaj, my question is not about uh, regarding the prayers, but Ashwatthama you mentioned, he released uh, multiple Brahmastras, no? Ashwatthama? He, he's what? He, uh, he, uh, he released multiple, many Brahmastras, one towards Arjuna and then one towards Parikshit Maharaj. Yes. Multiple right. Brahmastras. One towards Uttara's womb. Yes. Mm. So twice anyway it's mentioned that oh. he released the Brahmastra mm. somehow. Mm. So he had that power. He, he, he's an Anamara. He, he couldn't be killed, Ashwatthama. Oh. He's a powerful personality. He's still living. 
until the end of Kali Yuga. Mm. But he, he's, he's, he's cursed because of his sinful activities, because of his killing the, the sons of the Pandavas and so on. He's cursed that he will wander everywhere and nobody will come near him. He will, like they have maybe something like the abominable snowman, you know, in the Himalayas. There's the people talk about the abominable snowman. There's some creature, something, they wander around the Himalayas. So Ashwatthama is something like that, you know. He's because of his what he did, he's, he's got the karma, the reactions. He has to live like that for a long, for a terribly long time, completely alone just wandering everywhere until the end of Kali Yuga and then he will have another service to him. Yes. Hey, Rick Maharaj. Is it okay? Can I have one more question, Maharaj? Yes, last question. Arriba. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in the second slide, uh, in, in the 18th verse, uh, where Srila Prabhupada in the purport, he writes that Kunti Maharani, she will not make a mistake of bowing down to Krishna. Yeah. So can you explain, Maharaj? Because since she knows that Krishna is the Supreme Lord, then what is there wrong in bowing down to him? Well, the point is that she is the aunt of Krishna. Lord Krishna is coming to Kunti to respect her. He wants to take the dust from her feet. So she cannot just simply bow to him. But she worships him. She doesn't want to embarrass him because he, he, she is the aunt of Krishna. And Krishna is playing the part of her nephew. So she doesn't want to disturb the role. And she ha she at the same time she wants to offer her respect to Krishna. So she doesn't look at his lotus feet, but she begins from above his feet. She offers her respects to Krishna by, without going to his feet. Usually we will worship the Lord from his lotus feet, but Queen Kunti doesn't want to embarrass Krishna because she's the ant, she's superior. She's older. She's the sister of his father. So Lord Krishna wants to respect her. At the same time, she wants to show respect to Krishna. So she didn't worship him from the lotus feet, but she began from above his feet. Thank you, Maharaj. Understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. His Holiness. Bhakti Vigli Binasak Narsim Swami Maharaj Ki Srila Prabhupada Ki So tomorrow morning uh, Maharaj will give class on Dhruv Maharaj and On who? Dhruv Maharaj Oh okay Yeah tomorrow morning class will be on subject will be Dhruv Maharaj and evening same class will continue Kunti Priya